Uh, the reason uh, Dr. Alice Walker did not come back and say bye to you and to us is because she needed to get the limo to get to the airport to get to San Francisco. Last Wednesday night, I was talking to my mom on, on, on the phone. She's 98 and she had to put me to bed every night even though I don't want to. We had to talk about everybody who died this week. Okay? Yeah. 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 Talk about who, what came in the mail and stuff. So I turned on the computer. I know I'm going to get my recliner when I do this, but this Wednesday night I was by the computer. I turned it on and it was an email from Alice Walker saying, I'm not coming. She said, um, she talked with her travel agent. It was going to take her two days to get to Richmond. And she had just spent the winter in Mexico and she wanted to come to Richmond. I said, Mark, I got the phone. I've been praying for this. I knew something was going to happen. I said, Mark, I got the fuck. I got the fuck. Uh, you know it's going to work it out. You didn't do it. I said, Mark, I got to call my team. I'll get back to you. But you know it's all in God's hands and God's hands. I said, Mark, I'll get back to you. So then I called Dr. Allison B. Guys Johnson. I called Dr. Paula. I sent them an email from Allison. She said she's not coming because the gym has the stamina to take two days to get to Richmond. They said, let's come up with some options. So we came up with one option. She fly straight into Dallas. We sent a limo. Uh, we had about three options. That was at 10 o'clock that night. We emailed that one off. 6 o'clock that morning, Thursday morning, I got up. Like the Temptations, I ain't too proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> I was begging. I said, I don't know what's going to take you to get here. I was begging, pleading, conjuring, everything. I said, what is it going to take to get here? She was going to send us a video. Like I was going to be saying, oh no, I think I got 3,000 people coming. You got, you got to get here. I was even going to ask my nephew Nick to send his jet to <laughs> the caravan or something she had to come. So that Thursday, Dr. Parker said we're going to go. We had to walk through uh, um, St. Paul's to get the layout of what y'all saw last night. Walk through and see the other facility. And uh, then we stopped to get some soul food afterwards. <laughs> Most of the team, with nine of us are on the design team. They didn't know, just the three of us. So we seen that, seen that eating our collard greens and hot and cheese and cornbread and white fighting. Dr. Allison P. had salmon because she was trying to cook no meat something, I don't know. <laughs> but the rest of it was very good. And so we're sitting there just, just trying, to, trying to figure out. And then Dr. Parker got the call from uh, Dr. Alice Walker's assistant saying, she's coming. She said, she's coming. I started crying. <laughs> I started crying. I rededicated my life to cry. <laughs> Everybody you've heard since you arrived will be in conversation with you. Um, Dr. Nikki Finney, I guarantee you, when you listen to her, you're going to take something that you've never heard before. She did a poem when Dr. Uh, Emily Towns was the president of the American Academy of Religion. She came as our keynote speaker. And she did a poem about Katrina, 2005. Yes. And you felt like you were in the flu. Wow. And then she did paint that. She's a wordsmith. Yeah. And then another time she did a poem about uh, black men, older black men. And then if you had a good daddy, she had all like good daddies up there. <laughs> and then she talked about being in a place where 
a, a homeless woman was standing in the back of a room and she was reading poetry and at the end the woman said to Nick and Finney, you've never been hit, have you? I can tell by your voice. If you want to know what I mean when I say think with your heart and feel with your brain, Dr. Nicky Finney. Because I don't want all y'all see me gush. That's a private thing. Mannequins. Yeah. <laughs> My mother, the most beautiful woman in the 
the world would walk into Edwards 5 and Dine, Sumter, South Carolina to get a bag of wooden clothespins, or was it a four-pack of undershirts for daddy, mama dressed in a baby blue and white polka dot cotton sleeveless dress, cinched at the waist, arms freshly Vaseline, and her whole black female body shining like a bronze action figure. This is pre-Wakanda, folks. <laughs> And yet no one in charge looked our way. No one said, may I help you? And there she would wait impatiently, tapping her foot until another customer walked in, one quickly seen and quickly helped. That was the moment when Mama would raise her beautiful black arm high, the bare blades of deltoid, bicep, and anconus now radiant in the air. <laughs> America without the presence of their arms. That's right. Women who never hid their arms, who carried their arms brazenly, and sometimes because it was the only work we could get, lost an arm while working at the chicken or the flashlight factory. Women who liked their arms very much, thank you, needed their arms and shot out their arms to shield someone they loved. As a girl, I saw black women regularly pushing up their long sleeves or boldly sporting a sleeveless Sunday Easter dress because black arms had to breathe, stay free, be quick to open and ready to fly. Free arms can swim upstream, climb a hill, break a fall, propel a dance, arm wrestle southern white folks, daily foolishness. Babies had to be held, hugging had to happen, and signs had to be hoisted that said a man was lynched today. Black arms on black women defended themselves from raging policemen and sex-crazed guardians of the old guard. Wiser black arms taught us to fly our younger black arms like proud banners of the black country we dreamed our lives forward from. The black arms of the black women of so many families drove buses and carried weighty purses that doubled as hammerheads. Barriers might need dismantling in between breakfast and supper. Black arms on black women are valuable apparatuses for escaping, for pointing north to freedom, for recruiting black troops for the Union Army, for penciling notions of women's suffrage, documenting, detailing the horrors of lynching circa 1892, and thereby inventing investigative journalism in America, yeah. Yeah. out scene by scene, manual typewriter blazing the timeless raisin in the sun, Brave black arms assist in the raising of a historical hand. Remember that day in the House of Representatives, 1972, the Inquisitor, Barbara Jordan, she called herself at the impeachment hearings for President Richard Nixon. Their black arms show up like early tribal signage, travel signage of American history. Stop, go, turn here to make a young country stronger, better, more just. I love the bare arms of angry black women. Yeah. <laughs> that her ashes be scattered in a channel there, 
She feared that her body would be dissected and analyzed for scientific purposes as Aboriginal Tasmanian William Lynn's body had been. Despite her wishes, within two years her skeleton was exhumed by the Royal Society of Tasmania and later placed on display just like Sergeant Bartman's body was. Only in April 1976, approaching the centenary of her death, were True Janini's remains finally cremated and scattered according to her wishes. The greatest show on earth. Under glass and tint, floating in formaldehyde jelly, curled in a dead man's float, live the split, spread, unanesthetized legs of black women broken like the stirrups of a wishbone. Somebody got their wish and somebody didn't. The lilac plumage of our petal genitalia in all its royal mauve and rose plum with matching eggplant hips that pull the ocean across itself each night. Boats of peanut skin folded and rolled like the new fur. This, all proof of our pathology all cut away by pornographic hands fascinated with difference and the spectacle of being a black woman. So the normal pay their 50 cents to see what makes a freak a freak. Mm. Go ahead now, walk around her. She won't bite you. She is the headless woman. See her protruding mask. We don't have to be dead first to be cut into manageable size. One that fits their measuring rods, their medicine chest will not rest until we are properly pried open. It has always been about opening us up, experimenting with black women, but never dissecting their own desires. The sideshow was pitched on our backs, the speculum hammered out between our legs, Modern medicine was founded on the world of our hips. We, the standard pattern girth of every bustle skirt ever made. Black woman, a spectacle, wanting to but afraid to die, knowing death would never end such sterling silver lust. Bodies quake whole lifetimes in a National Geographic tremble until the obituary arrives. Please, Trujanini said, bury me behind the mountains so they can never find me. But they find her, and they dig her back up, and retrieve the last swatches of soft skin, the last twig of curved brown bone. Our opening, pirouetting vaginas, our African music boxes, are whittled down to perfect change her size. For the normal, who will always pay their 50 cents, to be sure and see what makes a freak a freak. So I am finishing a new book, and it's a book of occasional poetry. And when you say occasional poetry, there's some poets, they wrinkle up their face because occasional poetry doesn't have a lot of traditional support and uh, it's not thought to be an exciting area of literary endeavor. But you know, I come from a womanist tradition. And so I have to do what I'm supposed to do, not what you think I should do. And so this collection of occasional poetry stretches back to when I was nine years old and I wanted to do my part in that community where I saw other people doing their part. Mr. Mr. Brown was the electrician stringing wire through the homes of black people in the community I grew up in. Mr. Josh Neal was a carpenter and and Miss Susie was the nurse on, and you know, everybody was doing their part. Well, I was a little poet. And so people would begin to come to me and say, uh, Nikki, Miss Ruth is having her 90th birthday. We need a poem. <laughs> and I would say, okay, I'll get right on it. <laughs> the Manuel Methodist Church was turning 150 years old, and we needed a little poem to 
celebrate. And I said, okay, I'll get right on that. <laughs> so I had my assignments early on in my life as a poet. I did not mind that. In fact, I felt like I was a part of the community that was doing what it's needed to do to keep existing and keep surviving and keep thriving. And that's not how typical poets happen. But that's how I happen. So um, I, I, this next poem is about seeing a black woman. This is uh, every poem that is in this collection has a subtitle, like the, the, the other one said, on the occasion of seeing Michelle Obama's portrait. Well, this, this one is called Topless in America. And it's on the occasion of seeing a black woman walking on the side of the road, topless, and with no breasts. Mm. Yeah. The connection between our breasts and our feet is what this poem is about. Mm. And it is about the journey of Paulette Leapheart. Yeah. Some of you may know her story, yeah. but I was, when I first saw the picture of her walking on the side of the road from Mississippi to Washington, D.C. with her daughter in a carriage, I said to myself, I need to write something about that. Mm -hmm. She is a girly girl born with a beautiful pelvis. Living in New Orleans, two feet, two breasts, eight children, curvaceous and cute, she turns heads every day, social works to pay the bills, whispers to God. She's in her 50s when God whispers back. Mm -hmm. That bewildering third generation, stage two, pummeling black woman news. It's $5,000 a month to stay alive. Mm -hmm. She loses tatas, job, house, car. The long scar on her chest runs horizontal with the horizon. She sews her eyes down its back. A hot air balloon lifts her through chemotherapy beyond despair, arriving in Biloxi. Somewhere along the road to 50, she overhears that the pelvis is what makes us human. Her mother hands over black on black sneakers with an ancestral silver toe and hip silver swoosh. Her grandmother loans her a pair of loud lime green South African Baliga socks. Hit the road, daughter. The girly girl knows she doesn't need breasts to walk or breasts to be a girly girl. With both hands, she raises her blouse over her head. The sun paints her chest the same shade of girl that it did 40 years before when she was just eight and just an unknown girl on a beach, topless, with breasts still sleeping and the bones curl just below her clavicle. When a black woman decides to walk topless for 1,034 yeah. miles, yeah. things get aligned. Yeah. Ears line up over shoulders, shoulders over hips, hips over knees. Her spine is soon shot out of the cannon, just like the 1850 insomniac Harriet. Her nipples calibrating due north and freedom instead of sleep. When a black woman makes up her mind to walk topless, for 1,034 miles, a film crew can change their mind, but a daughter's witnessing eyes are irreversible. Yeah. Madeline's eight-year-old breasts are still in the deep sleep of girlhood when they leave, when they take off, just like retro girly girl back on the beach. She sets sail from Biloxi, Mississippi on April 30th. Her ghost nipples spin as dual compass. Five miles an hour, eight hours a day. For 60 days, topless in the sun and the driving rain, the Republic's electronic book of faces hears the news and goes neon. Ten million eyes dial in. The first of 12 police cars stop her. She smiles and holds a class in indecent exposure along the side of the road. There are no tummy bars and benches to hold them, so they stand up. Resolution. Here is the definition of indecent exposure. It's not illegal for her shirt to be off if her nipples are only ghosts. Yeah. The po I gotta stop and say this again. The police stop her because it is illegal if you have your top off and you are a woman if your nipples are showing. But she has no nipples. <laughs> On the police car radio, NPR is interviewing John Napier, a paleontologist. The topic is walking. 
As the policemen finish up their selfie with the topless woman who can still turn her head, they do not hear the paleontologist say, quote, human walking is unique. The body step by step teeters on the edge of catastrophe. The mother-daughter team is back on the road. The girly girl has 100 ligaments in each of her feet. Her transverse arch is the major weight-bearing bridge in her body. Her Achilles is the most critical tendon, running from her calf muscle up to the back of her heel, helping her push off with her toes and propel her body towards senators and marble halls and the back of Madeline's stroller. With each step, she takes a new beauty shop under construction. Yeah. This one will not be designed and assembled by the chairman of the board of the Tatas. She moves one foot in front of the other. Highway 29, Highway 1, the Jefferson Davis Highway, the Warren Abernathy Road, the Blue Star, High, the Blue Star Highway, the monument to the sink signer of the Declaration of Independence in Georgia, the Indian Mounds of North Carolina, the Tatas Bureau keeps an eye out for the June Jordan Expressway, the Archer yeah. Lord Highway, yeah. the yeah. Gilda Radner Overpass, yeah. the seventh of 12 police cars pulls up alongside Madeline's stroller. In each new jurisdiction, the men and women in blue want to have a word with her, want to survey the topography of her chest, want answers she's patiently already given seven times before, want to make sure there is no indecent exposure taking place on the Jefferson Davis Highway North. Another class on the same topic is held again, over and over again. The girly girl explains that wanting to live is legal in every state. Yeah. For 60 days, the sneering, breathtaking, rocky road exhaust of 18 wheelers coats her mouth. Through dust, tar, and fumes, she passes used car lots, daydreaming of driving the rest of the way in a canary yellow Mustang convertible. There are strip malls, Mexican restaurants, neon motel signs, advertising $20 a night rooms and 19 Holy Ghost praise houses leaning in with tamarind. Yes, yes. The handmaidens of 40,290 women take turns rubbing her legs down every night. Mm. Mother and Madeline munch on five pounds of peaches, four pounds of plums. They talk about school and family and how different the rain feels when you cannot run from it. The mother-daughter train stops to read historical markers from Biloxi, Mississippi to Washington, D.C. The woman who has been known to turn ahead wants Madeline to know how the world was made and how it can be made differently. She does not drink enough water. It's April, it's May, it's June. The pavement melts beneath her feet. The asphalt doesn't care that she doesn't have breasts. The asphalt doesn't care that Madeline is eight. The blisters, callous feet, the inside of her palms, gross stones, bloody. She keeps pushing Madeline's tiny, sleeping breasts on up the road. It's a tar beach voyage, and Madeline will not be next. The ghosts of 40,290 dead women who had breast cancer whisper that they have voted to take their tops off too. <laughs> Solidarity forever. Mother and daughter eat little Debbie pies and suck on firecracker popsicles until their lips are red, white, and blue. Strangers following them on the Republic's electronic book of faces pull up alongside of them for selfies. They deposit small tubs of watermelon, a box of KFC, a foil bag of Chick-fil-A. Another woman drops off a homemade plate made from her own dinner pots. The gravel on the road hitchhikes a ride inside their shoes. The pummeling rain turns the Jefferson Davis Highway into a sliding mud pit of summer quicksand. The girl, the girly girl's breastplate, complete with horizon star, has been staring back at the sun and the rain of 45 uncommon days. What does the world see when a black woman accustomed to being a woman and turning heads takes off her top and walks 1,034 miles across America, up a highway named for the president of the Confederacy, a woman teetering on the edge of catastrophe, a girly girl with her missing ghost nipples now turned, tuning forks turned toward freedom. She is a woman they cannot arrest. <laughs> They cannot arrest her for not having what they believe she should have yeah. in order to be called a woman. Yeah. The burning summer rain sizzles on the hot asphalt. The sun breaks their two backs into a twin portrait of two thirsty marigolds climbing. A truck door swings open by mistake, hitting the girly girl as it passes. She pitches a roll. Get up, girly girl. A woman who has refused her own catastrophe is walking across America with her daughter. 
Police car number 12 arrives. Madeline is asleep. Why don't they talk to each other on their Blue Way radio? Yes. Can't someone dispatch the update? A black woman walking topless across America is not illegal. The girly girl's pelvis evolved 1.9 million years ago. This noble soldered saddle of bone is what makes us all stand upright. Helps us change direction, spin, swivel, adjust, reach, reconfigure when we find we need to march on and not crumble. The long column of our human body requires the marble of the pelvis to conduct when all else fails. The missing tatas are not what matter. The pelvis matters. The dead women of the chorus of breast cancer matter. God finding the girly girl on the beach and whispering go topless in her ear matters. Her mind is 1,034 miles away on the marble steps of Congress waiting for the rest of her to arrive. She whispers this, dear Senator, you don't know me, but my pelvis is 1.9 million years old. Mm -hmm. And 60,290 women with pelvises just like mine received a new <coughs> breast cancer diagnosis in 2015. And 40,290 died of the disease. Yeah. I would like a minute of your time. No, I did not fly here. My testimony was not subpoenaed. I am not the kind of woman to bear all, but I have walked topless to show that I will not hide anymore. When her breasts were cut away, she decided to travel light. She had nothing of excess, only essentials. Firecracker popsicles, peaches, intact pelvis, sweet oil of Madeline, three changes of clothing, a cell phone, a stroller, and her daily dear God. Her prayers fueled by the power of electrolytes and the salt and pepper kindness of strangers. In the blazing summer sun, the sweet Georgia peaches go down easy in the warmth of mother and daughter mouths. You can still be alive without your breasts. I'm still beautiful, she tells her daughter. The girly girl proclaims, certainly no less a woman. The woman who can still turn her head is showing the world what a woman's body looks like when war has been declared. Mm -hmm. The look of more than catastrophe. How the curve of the human spine will absorb the sad shock of news it did not want to hear. The magic of bipedal locomotion and strong knees when we stand it up, then hold out our arms and say, now walk. The breastless body in full sail moving the wheels of the determined mind, the orchestra of the pelvis singing from the hymnal of courage. Page 24, what it means to be woman and opening a new beauty shop without a permit or permission. The birthday sunrise of the girly girl arrives. It's June 30th. She pushes Madeline Stroller past Quantico, past the Pentagon past the 14th Street Bridge. The steps of the Capitol see her coming. Madeline stands up.
the one who came to start the next civil war speaks to her directly. Have I shot you yet? Is what he says. There is no one else left to answer. In the church basement, all are dead or bleeding out. Miss Polly, half on her knees, is askew, tilted. It is her last angle. She is akimbo to the eight others who are sprawled and already spiraling toward heaven. In her mind, she too is about to die. There is no place to hide when you are the last one facing the waving gun. The air has been invaded by a poison mix of bright red ore spewing from his mouth. There was a spilling. There is about to be another. He cannot see the seeping septic colors, but she can. And there is no isthmus wide enough beneath her shield of a table to keep her from the current of his nonstop debris. A floating band of iron-orange tincture crooks her pounding heart, but does not push her downstream. She waits sideways, as high up as she can, refusing to look at him. She knows how evil can enter through the iris if beheld too long. She will not be all black and blue, unsure of what has been released in the room. A river of flaming copper is moving slowly through her blood. She is an honest woman and has seen with her own two honest woman eyes what hate erupting inside a man can do and what this one has just done. She decides Miss Polly does, that her last words on this earth will not be camouflaged and khaki, handed over just before he runs out the same way he walked in. That's right. When he shot the pastor first, she could have faked it. She could have fallen over sideways, held herself perfectly still, asked her body to lie for her, but that would not have been the life she has lived. It will not be the death she dies at his feet. So she turns into the last one standing there beneath the collection table, and her molten answer arrives. The color of pounded beets it is, beaten out of their safe skins it is. Her permission words outline every beloved bullet riddle body still lying around her on the floor. Have you shot me yet? No, you have not. That is all she says. That is the end of the sentence. <laughs> One of the things I've been uh, thinking about a lot, well, I have a quirky mind, which I love, which used to get me in trouble, but that was the old days. My quirky mind saves me now. Yeah. Yeah. Save me then, but I don't know it. This is called Yellow. And I was there was a runaway slave poster exhibit up north somewhere, I can't remember now. And I imagined in that runaway slave poster exhibit, uh, what if I don't know if you've ever read one. I know some of you have, but it, one of the things that's on the exhibit is there's a description of the runaway slave person, and usually it, it's always from the uh, perspective of those people that were called masters, but were not. And so I took that 
perspective and persona, and I imagine that Zora Neale Hurston went missing. It's called Yellow. One yellow gal with an all black tongue on a white horse is missing. She is thick and well made, walks erect like a black high rise from a small Negro town, speaks fluent Negro, tells a plausible story, talks generously to herself, last seen wearing John's black trousers and my good red fedora, recently shipped back from Paris. She cleans house and yard the same poorly. With an uninterested half sweep is best at the muck of field work, has amused disposition, a stubborn countenance, carries a sing-songy, whiny voice while telling a colorful story in Futurama 3D. She does my girl's hair up all shiny with her snake oil concoction, picks and files my nails clean, but only when I threaten to take her quill away. Best table serving Negro gal I ever owned. Nosy and nervous, likes to be amongst fine things and people, all kinds, all proud to listen in on her clicking, her, the way her tongue can make when allowed. She sings when she's hauling, hums when she's standing still, high cheekbones, which she prefers to adorn with coal, teased down to putty by the fire, and the pumpkin pollen of flowers. She's prone to play with long stem cotton mostly stolen from the field, wears a necklace of petrified bowl weevil casings, what she calls her field pearls. She's been whipped and whipped again for assigning every Negro on the place a birthday and for tying flowers together for herself. For settling in her windowsill, she won't sleep without a tick of cane sugar tucked beneath her tongue. <laughs> 1500 is what I'm offering. The horse can be the place. The yellow gal cannot. Bought and pulled her out of her mother's arms myself when she was 230 now and quick to tell you she was born in the right silk body but to the wrong cotton world. Beaten, as I said, good and often, most every day to no avail for laughing in the face of every should be crying thing. Believing every day she's as good as my own two girls moves with a swiveling, dancing gait, and dwells only in her own make-believe mind. All black worlds laid out like bustle skirts around her neck. You will find a bag of fresh garlic there in the back dangling, rides a second sachet of rose petals, all of it hanging on a catgut cord. Won't matter if you cut it away, she will have another rest in there by morning. She won't deny herself. No matter how much I whip or send her back to her tree box for the week, she will steal what she can't have, make what she can't steal, and you will know you have the right one when you turn her hands face up to the sun and see her palms all blue streaked like the good pottery found in the sideboard. She has taken up the bad habit of writing directly on her skin. Who taught her those words? There are three identifying nonsensical markings that I have seen myself when she has been properly stripped and properly prepared for beatings. Down her left arm reads, he be a bee to blossom. What does that mean? Down her right arm, all the way to her heel bone, it says, six eyes questioning God. Lastly, around her right breast, like she is the sea of Saturn itself, there is a circle of mumbling words no one can figure. None of us have 300 years, it says. She has so many names, I can't keep up. She is the only Negro I got who won't fall on her knees and pray, even if I beat her twice a day. If you find her, the first thing she will tell you without asking the Lord or you for permission is this. The mighty sunshine is my only house of prayer. Her two calico dresses are with her for sure. Her good straw bonnet, one jar of seashells, all stuffed away in my missing small French grip. She won't answer to Janie or Dambala, even though that's what the others call her. You may beat and mark her freely. That is not my concern. Strip her down good, just do not kill her. Return her to me. My everyday life is not the same without her. 
She is tangled up and touched in the head and bought and bossed. And she is black and yellow and simply will not adjust. But there is still time. I am still a young woman with dedicated weapons of my own. Bring her back to me. Give me my chance to break her. If you see her on the road, make sure you stop her good. She will try and break away by looking her most mean and impressive self. In that quick moment, she will size you up like a lightning bolt does the empty sky. Next thing you know, you will be off the hunt and looking down for your daddy's name in the dirt. She will tell you to go and ask her horse. <laughs> if you ask her who she is, but don't you move an inch. Be aware of her trying to speak her mind around you like a net. There is a lasso waiting in her mouth. Mm -hmm. Her ropey words are worth all the money in this pot to me. If a good iron bit sits lonely in the back of your wagon doing nothing, throw her sassy backside down and push it tight across her face before the long ride back to me. Let her breathe for nothing more. Cover her winding lips quick. Close down that mouth that honeys out a new story every morning like she pulled it from the Milky Way. Mm. She is so beguiling. You will forget all plantation manners, lullabies, how much blood your hands have drawn over the years. Did I say how much I will pay you? Close her mouth down with whatever you have. Iron balls, chicken feathers, tar babies, croker sack, barbed wire, loblolly vine. She will tell you of lost cities, of Indians themselves. Hi, John, the great and conquering one. Things so unbelievable, black and fine. You will stare and forget and lose your place. All that you had your mind on before she opened her mouth. Her fluid silk so Negro talk will tie tangle you up full of that double descriptive mesmerizing chatter. If you can hear them in the field always singing to each other about them. But on her tongue and accompanied by banjo, it arrives with bees and butterflies in tow. The night before she ran, I went looking for her. She had been sent to the kitchen to bring the iron kettle back for the guests. But instead, I found her on the veranda, all the wooden shutters thrown back and open, standing there with the kettle snug in her arms, three slants of light dancing in on her iron yellow face, and looking out over my daddy's land, out all the way even to where the orange strings of last light set down along the last bite of green. And canary, right where I like to look myself. At the end of the day, across the cabins, right where the river breaks in two, where the light heads out, she was staring, ignoring me. A hurricane of eyes set on something great and beyond, just like she was a white woman. <laughs> With a shucked and shiny world, all her own to come. She did not move. Not even when I called her name and I called them all. Jack spun her around and slapped her good before her feet were even in place. The kettle flew into the window and she twisted herself away. And that's when she started singing this. Oh, the white girl ride in a Cadillac. The yellow girl ride in the same. The black girl ride in a rusty Ford. But she get there just the same. <laughs> One yellow gal with an all black tongue riding on a white horse talking about riding something called a Cadillac has gone missing. She thinks she is some kind of a mountain. She may be carrying a pocket compass with a long stem of white cotton across her ear, arms and breasts tattooed in rainbow and other colors. She was last seen on a back road heading deep south. If you find her, return her to me. I promise you, with every letter of the alphabet, she belongs to me, and therefore can belong to no other. If you can hold her there until I get to you, the $1,500 will be yours. <laughs>
to ask your permission to read this last poem, which is the newest poem that I finished for the collection. It's called Linea Negra. And the Linea Negra is the black line on a pregnant woman's belly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It goes from the breastbone down to the pelvis. And we can talk about this in the Q&A, but the subtitle of this is on the occasion of the death of my father on December 3rd, 2017. And it might seem a little strange that I'm hiding something like Nea Negra, which is about birth and pregnancy. But if you knew my father and you knew me and you know how connected we were for 60 years, you would know that my father gave birth to me in as much a way as my mother gave her. And it was through one thing in particular that he did give birth to me. He saw me. He never wanted me to be anything but who I was. And in that moment, in those many moments between a father and a daughter, I was able to become who I became because I knew he was always there. And so I would like to read this poem and in this amazing moment in my life with you today, and I want you to be sure and hear these four moments that also about, are about my day and Negro. Um, I'm going to talk about black girls who were made to lie down and have sex with dogs while you and peacekeepers watch. I'm going to talk about black girls' faces who were blown off when their cars broke down and they only went to the house to ask for help. Yes. I'm going to talk about black girls thrown against the wall of a schoolhouse in South Carolina because she was looking into her phone and not paying attention. And I'm going to talk about black girls, black girls, Linea Negra. It was 79 degrees when I was born, sunny, there was wind. Monarch butterflies frantically migrated the 5,000 miles from Canada to Mexico. I loved being a black girl back then. At the beginning, Daddy lifted me up after school with his baby blue Electra 225 pointing to Alpha. That's right, that's right. Lost land of black swans with wide Negro red lips, balding cypress tupelo gums in drag, pushing showy out of shiny black water before the coming of shapely legs and bright eyed breasts before knowing that I was hunted, he would open the back door of the Buick and say, climb in, baby. I would lie back all the way flat in position beneath the long back window curling in on both ends. The ledge, I called it. Thin black line of my long black girl body poured into a warm crystal pan. In place, my arms ready at my side. My long toes tipping into the overhead, spread black girl eagle in the long back capsule of the super silver deuce and a quarter with fender skirts. He would shift it down a slow creek through the former land of ivory bill woodpeckers as close to the shiny black water as we could crawl. Our one car parade snail inching through red mud with long ticking hands. My eyes fashioned in two opal periscopes, floating above like the, eye, the lilac Japanese irises, canopies of biscuit-wide magnolia, silent watching for the arrival of the most perfect splinter of before or after sunlight. Such are the vicissitudes of life, he would say to me, my fingers tracing the glass above me past there in between green-blue waves that have long-tempered see-through, friny things 
that had already left the floodplains to enter the higher world. Where close watch was kept on the black swan squawk waddling into nests near a bustle skirt of thirsty tupelos. Baby, the bird is in your hands, he would say, and I would swallow, and the sliding dark skinned Buick would keep moving. Formation left right to the rising balloon of my own hunting, nibbling mind. His only girl, supine and flat in black, <coughs> flat girl space. Beneath the longest lens of my girlhood, before the UN peacekeepers arrived and wasted no time in pulling me out feet first to lay me on their ground 6,922 miles back across the sea where my arms were tied above my head to the small waist of a rubber tree where their wild dogs sniffed, then parted my legs with their wet snouts, straddled and poked me until they shook, then disappeared back into the quiet woods the horn-like peacekeepers with their useless ring of keys, their hands MJ between the khaki thighs of their peacekeeping uniforms, this, the there and then time of loving to be a black girl. Mama hummed while oiling my hair at night before sleep in the twin bed in the shoebox bedroom. With the crouching window that opened to the knotty love seat arms of a china berry where we lived in the tiny mother of pearl house on West Oakland Avenue, where one giant fuchsia and one giant eggplant azalea preened each year into the dawn of Easter, twin boutonnieres pinned to the grassy lapel of our tiny front yard across from the park, where girls like me suck pixie sticks and hula hoops on one end of the basketball court, where boys like me ate atomic fireballs, hooping and hollering on the other, including Ludie May, her one hand day in, day out, titty tight inside her left hand, catcher's mitt. Ludie May, who wanted more than a girl's life, who played hard, harder, hardest with the boys, was twice as better and one half a boy herself. At the games, the whole boys kept whipping the whole girls at. Her mother with three jobs and eight days a week, heavy punch card eyes, cared, but not enough to stop the freight train home run slide of her fifth daughter's slew-footed feet into the first base. Us whole girls bored Ruby May, but still we made her fingers inside Sunday glove of a mitt. If we stood too close, Louie May wanted Cracker Jacks across the pitcher's mound. Quick zippers on every pocket, lift off her liquid good luck, the dab of her old man's old spice she would put behind her ears for her future World Series. I wanted Tupelo trees. I wanted passage to the other side, my black girl prism above the land of black swans whose wings from the first had already been cut. A black girl spread eagle because flat on my back made the plane lift rise high through the swaying dense hard woods. One long-legged window of the first Land Rover. It was a 1969 maroon Buick 225. It was 99, 89. 69, 79 degrees when I was born. <laughs> Sun drenched, not yet hot as old fashioned love, daddy used to say. His brown tobacco face wry with half a ham bone Smithfield smile. He having just said the most city thing he would ever say. There was wind, golden monarchs flew the 5,000 miles, their gauzy wings parachute wide. Their zeal for international time zones was not the great news back then. Cannons of silver water pounding the shiny bicycle hard thighs of black boys into the curb. The patent leather feet of their sisters being lifted off manicured lawns was the news. Butterflies were only orange and black flying machines. I loved being a black girl from the very start. When daddy drove me slow through his land of landlocked, thick-lipped black swans, creased as a freedom rider's bus prayer inside the Buick's great bay, while every brown-headed thrasher and chickadee motioned to me by his eyes, first warbled, then moseyed up my sleeve to hibernate through my black girl winters. Before legs and breasts, before the arrival of the whispers of being hunchbacked and hunted, marked, I loved being a black girl, but had not yet learned to play dead had not yet been emptied out of my school desk onto the learning floor. Peacekeeper punishment for staring into the cobalt eyes of my phone instead of answering his question. He is still holding me half in the air, half into the wall. I wonder aloud while I'm up there, is my mother dead? When I hit the ground, who will brush my hair? I love being a 
black girl before I knew the dangers, preferred days of staring up through custom-made glass private monocle for black girls' speculative thinking. I have not yet walked to a stranger's door, my dead battery of a car waiting behind me, my human knock for help, not yet met by a double barrel shotgun blast to my face. I still have time to say I love being a black girl, but it may be too soon to think it will always be this way. I have not yet become one of the 64,000 black girls missing in America that no one is looking for. Warm oil waits on the tips of my mama's fingers. She says, I should still love being a black girl. She is the black girl looking through the trees, reason that I love being a black girl. She says, the mind of a black girl is a good mind to see light through. I hold fast my steady oblong stare, up through the long glass, up through the higher trees. She should know when we still live together belly to belly after the two-door black valiant shape shifted into the moss green deuce and a quarter in the sandy driveway across from the park before I was faced out to the world and no longer faced in only to her when we were the same body but two different minds. And the falcon heavy wing doors lifted slowly to let us step out into the waiting firing squads. Her eyes had that, what should I do now, Lou? When you were born, she'd say to the soap in the kitchen or the paint by number set in the den, it was 79 degrees, not a cloud in the sky, blustery, words as thick as old-fashioned love for waiting in the air for you. There was full sun, and your father named you Love Child. Mm -hmm. To be sure you would not forget to look high into the canopies. Every night before bed, he would stand outside your window, the soap bucket in one hand, his first dollar ever made in the other. He would wash the extra long window at the back of whatever colored viewers was in the driveway, polishing the seat through until it squeaked. The tip of his Salem 100 blowing out like the tail of a wildcat comet. He would stare into the spotless glass and I would wonder, would it ever be clean enough for him to leave for you so you could find your way into the world he left you up your sleeve? <laughs> Reclined now on my black girl back, I wonder if the monarchs will ever return to cut the trees, their bodies fluttering tambourines, refusing to give up on their children tonight. Tonight I'll braid invisible microphone wires into my hair because at dawn, the surgical teams will pull me out of the back window. Feet first, prone, place me on their table with wheels. I won't be able to see their faces before the operation, but they will be able to see mine. The long, loose, black girl mouths of my twin sleeve birdhouses will be sewn shut. They will instruct me to count backwards until I cannot find my way back to my daddy's black swans. They will have their tools, and I will have mine. Mm. They will wheel me into their do-no-harm galaxy. Mm. And before or during the operation, they will apply their harm legally, <coughs> cut me open mischievously, pitch their circus tents, bark into the 400-year-old shimmy-shimmy black star light for my black girl body. Mm. On their table, surrounded by snickering circles, <coughs> wearing hippopotamus masks, holding scaffolds, making their rounds with my extended hair, my wide belly button, my prolonged hips, my elongated lips, their proffered laughter hovering the crisp white sheets, my tiny hidden black girl wires in my hair, catching it all on tape, ready for the nightly news report current data concerning the horizontal state of black people. I loved being a black girl back then, because black girls could lie flat on our backs under a blown, resplendent glass sky. The breath of the last ivory bill woodpecker feathered across our faces, encircled by the hum and flutter of dark-eyed juncos and goldfinch, released into the air by the ones who named us and we're now ready to coax our uncut wings out from our long sleeves and our open hands. Daddy said, baby, how you live your life can be the child you never had. Mm -hmm. When I was born, 
It's 79 degrees outside. Windy, a baby blue sky was filled with orange and black wings. The nail head V8 in daddy's black and gold Electra was running. Her quirky mind. 
My mother did, sorry mom, didn't nurture my <laughs> My father saved my quirky mind. Amen. And my mother was afraid for me to have it. Tony, Mar Tony K. from Barr talks about being a child in the middle of her mother's kitchen floor and how her mother mopped around her. My mother didn't mop around me. She would tell me to get up and go to the house and do it in the proper way. And my father would say, let's get in the car. So that's what I mean by he would save me. And so recognizing, seeing the child before you who is not maybe your brother, might have two brothers, who um, didn't have that, you know, didn't have that quirky mind thing. And they became lawyers and I became a poet. And so I became who I was supposed to become. I mean, Dr. Dr. Katie Karen talks about how you can't really do your work until you know who you are. Right? And knowing who you are is like the biggest present you give yourself every single day. I didn't know that I would one day have the joy and pleasure to stand before a group of, of you know, who Lucy Clifton would call people of my tribe. Yeah. But I knew I couldn't be anything else. And one thing about being who you are, you will begin to find like-minded people. Yeah. If you are being yourself. If you're being somebody else, then yeah. other people will come and go. Yeah. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah. It did. Okay. And, and then some. And then some. Okay. Thank you for sharing some wonderful images and, and um, other nests. So my question for you is how do you nurture your other nests, your quirkiness, your creativeness, your, um, uh, I see the box, but it's not a box nest. Uh, every day, I, um, I am a, I, since, since the age of 10, I have kept a journal book. I have 174 hardback journal books. But I have a bookshelf that on the wall with numbers 1 through 174. And those books are where I went to figure out the same questions we were talking about this morning about why is, why is white supremacy so prevalent. Why do white people hate black people? I mean, these, I'm a nine-year-old kid asking myself these questions. Uh -huh. You know, why does my father have to keep getting kind, thoughtful, smart black kids in college out of jail? Mm -hmm. Those are the questions that I wrote as a kid, as a child. And so my whole my whole feelings about justice. I remember being, my first book came out. This, I had a reading and somebody said, well, you're writing some political stuff because there was a poem in there about a, a young African-American uh, artist, who, <laughs> graffiti artist, who was shot in New York City in the 1980s mm. uh, because he was drawn on a wall. And so these are the, you know, I've always pursued justice through the means of metaphor and simile and I, and I write every single day because I think that the only way you stay close to your quirky mind and your central self is to, you know, not give in to the television and not give in to all those other very easy things, but to sort of confront the thing that is before you about you. And it takes work. And I tell my students right now, you all aren't working hard enough because you're not, you don't know who you are. Because one day you're this and one day you're that. And there's no core of you that you understand yeah. to be the core. It's not that you can't change, change it always. But when I ask you what are your, what things make you smile? What things make you who you are? You can't answer me. And so I, I go to that place every day for uh, communion. And another answer to that is my, my grandmother was my North Star. She was a farming woman in, North, in Newberry, South Carolina. And she was the woman, you know, four foot 10 and all tornado. <laughs> and every summer she would go to a revival meeting. And it was, that week in June, that was her week. Well, this is like revival for me. I can't even oh, this is revival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's revival. Yeah. Okay, so 
um, I've been writing in my journal today about the revival of the spirit mm -hmm. and how revival meeting, camp meeting, as she would call it, is happening right here today. Yes. And I'm connecting this moment with that moment from 50 years ago. Okay. So that's my little working mind. This is our last question. But well, we have questions tomorrow because everybody's presented today. Thank you for your work. I was about to ask this question, but you already kind of spoke to it. And it's this question. What's the importance of knowing home, reclaiming home, and professing home, and doing and living the work that our souls must have? I know I'm bringing Dr. Katie in this a lot, but I have to because I wanted to talk about this. I was watching her on a video a couple of weeks ago, and she was sitting there talking about the day after emancipation, Black mothers went out into the fields and across the fields into the other plantation sites looking for their children. And black mothers said, that's my baby, that's my son, that's my child, she got my eyes, he's got my feet. She went and gathered up the children that had been taken from her. She wanted the home that she had made through her body to be brought back together. You have to figure out where home is. Home does not have to be where you were born or who you were born to. But you need a place, as Tony Morrison says in the definition of home, where you can lay your head where you can yeah. Yeah. Home is central to me, because if I'm writing something tough, there's something when I stand up to read it, I don't know what I'm going to get back. I need to know I can close my door or call somebody or be at home somewhere. So um, I came back home four years ago to take care of my father who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And he and my, my, my mom and I were his caregivers for four years before he died. I was going to come if I didn't have a job. I know how to work, and I would have found work. Okay. Luckily, I found a job, and that was this has worked out fine. But I needed to be here for this moment in my father's life because he had been in every moment and given me everything before I left. So,